I want to start uh, by thanking everyone who's here for being here and thanking the team at Goldschfest for giving me this opportunity to speak. Those of you here who planned to attend this workshop and those who just found your way here, um, it's really an honor to be asked to speak and those of us who are here have at least some kind of interest in the deeper aspects of our lives and particularly today who and what we are and this is commonly thought of the self when we think of I and we say I am this I am that so in our going about in the ways we relate to each other our activities our jobs and much of what we do day to day we use this concept of a self we use the word I to refer and and we separate ourselves for useful purposes between me and you and him and her and they etc um, just this morning these uh, kids were here early for the yoga and um, one of them was getting on some yoga mat here and the girl said hey that's not your yoga mat did you put it there so don't get on it um, and I that's when I thought yes yes that's that's a very default mode of being is to keep track of things um, to to respect personal space and all that so there's this social practical aspect of being a self being an I that is it's sort of at the surface level and what we're going to do today is look a bit deeper it's like a meditation and it's also a philosophical conversation and um, I don't think of myself as a teacher usually because um, so there may be a bit of teaching happening here today because I may bring up something that uh, any one of you did not previously know, some kind of information, and therefore you would have learned it and I would have taught it. But the topic today, who are you really, I don't claim to be someone who knows who you are or who really knows who I am in a sense of having some kind of information that I can give. And really what this is, what we are, is something that can't fully be encapsulated in words and language. And we'll be getting into that in, in what it really means there. Um, it's something, though, that we all have this, this kind of knowing that goes deeper than words. And so by talking about it with words, we always kind of circle around this. Uh, but it points directions, this core knowledge within our, our beings, and it's like a remembering in that sense. So with my words, and when we open it to a question and answer conversation, our words together, uh, we may have a deep sort of remembering. So the full title of this workshop is, Who Are You Really? A Semiotic Spin on Selfhood. And the word in that title that many of you may be unfamiliar with, if you are, that's great, is semiotics. How do you spell that? S, well, I'll write it here, actually. Um, yes, so, the other word that maybe isn't so common is selfhood. I maybe just coined that, but it's that state of being a self. Um, so, there's some words that we should learn here. Okay, teach. <laughs> <laughs> so semiotics comes from the ancient Greek word, and I, I don't know if I'm spelling it right, but it should actually be spelled in Greek anyways, but this is the English version. Semeon, which means a sign. A sign is something that in the basic sense you read like it has words on it but a sign is also anything that we any object or or experience we encounter in the world that has meaning to us um, and so when getting a meaning 
from something, anything. You read words and they mean something to you. Somebody does something, it means something to you. You see a phenomenon happening in nature, it means something to you. Um, this process, um, in semiotics we call it semiosis. And even though it's a word you may not be familiar with, for those who talk about this stuff a lot, you can probably see the utility of coming up with a word to sort of be a placeholder to describe that. And it makes it easier to say that semiotics is when we look closely and examine the semiosis that is constantly taking place throughout our lives. Semiotics is also commonly used to refer to like the academic field, which is a cross-disciplinary area that sort of falls between philosophy and science, and some people in semiotics lean more towards the philosophy side, and some are trying to make it more like a science. And I came into that word and that area of theory, because it's really more about theory, and there's some research involved too, but I came into the area of semiotic theory uh, when I was working on a thesis, I was choosing a thesis to work on in my philosophy undergrad, and I knew that I had a really deep preoccupation with meaning and how language seems to have an important effect on our reality. The words that we use to describe ourselves, other people, our experiences, are interrelated with all of that. And in fact, the words are actually objects in themselves. When you write something, you're creating a visual um, phenomenon. When you speak language, you're vibrating the air in a specific pattern that is picked up by, by the ears of those who understand it. And those who don't know the meaning of the words, it's just gonna sound like blah 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 blah. But those who do know the meanings of the words will derive meaning from that experience. And um, that area that looks more closely at this stuff is semiotics. So, in this workshop, so in some of my other workshops, I like to basically see what happens if we can take a semiotic approach to different aspects of our lives. Um, I talk briefly about the self sometimes, so like, what words do you use to describe yourself? How do you encounter yourself in a meaningful way on the day to day? Um, and also how we relate to others, how the ways that we interact with each other can have meanings, the words that we say to each other, the things we do, and also applying that semiotic aspect to our world view. Um, what is the world to us? What is this or that experience really meaning? And the semiotic approach to that is to be aware of this semiosis process happening. So something meaning what it does is actually an active, engaged, participatory process. And if we go around on autopilot just um, taking it in and assuming that this is what it means, um, we're not really doing semiotics, but we're still doing semiosis. All life does semiosis, actually. The semiotic aspect is becoming aware about that and reflecting on that. So I think I've given a good idea of the distinction between semiotics when we do it and the semiosis we do. But also look at animals, uh, the dog who hears your whistle and comes, or is these things that we can't smell, and our umwelt, our world of meaning, is different from um, animals who don't have access to language, because we have this whole linguistic aspect, this scaffolding of concepts and mythology and ways of understanding and becoming aware of our understanding. And one might even say that each individual has their own unique self because we come into experiences with different memories, with different understandings of words, different languages. People on the other side of the world who don't know any English, um, like trees are all around everywhere, but you have different words for it with different etymology depending on the language. and. Um, yeah, so that's sort of some sneak peek into jumping into the semiotic approach to life is when we start thinking about that. And for today's workshop, I want to focus in on the self. Um, and one more thing I was going to do is you go deeper, right? Um, plants also do this. This isn't just animals. 
um, there's a type of bean called the fava bean that when um, when aphids come and they start preying on the plant, they start eating it, it releases a chemical that attracts an aphid parasite to come land on the plant and eat up the aphids. And then what happens, so first of all, you have this chemical signal that is detected by the parasite, it's attracted to it for whatever reason. It's just another animal that only eats the aphids. It comes onto the plant, but then at the same time, the other beings in the vicinity who are not having any aphid infestations yet, will start releasing that chemical once one plant does. So it's like the plants are picking up this chemical signal and reading it through each other. And you can even see it at the basic um, aspect of plants that you put towards the window, their leaves grow towards the sun. If you rotate it, then a few days later, the leaves will have turned and point towards the sun because the plant gets nourishment from the light. Now, do we have to anthropomorphize this in the way that we do? Not necessarily. Semiosis is a deep process of interpretation. And um, one way of looking at it in, say, biosemiotics, which looks at through, through all of life, not just at the human level, is that it's that transfer across a surface. Um, because how do you interpret if there's not the integrating into another system? So like, for example, the human mind and our interconnected series of meanings that are interdependent on each other, if you change the meaning of one word or important um, concept in your life, it could affect everything else because it's a whole integrated framework. Um, that other thing has to pass through the surface of interpretation. That's one way of conceptualizing it. And I like that because if we go down to the most basic cellular level, let's draw a little single cell here with a nucleus and some little organelles. I'm obviously not focusing super hard on that. But this cell has like a little flagellum that it can move and wiggle to move. That's how single-celled organisms, most of them propel themselves through a medium, is with um, some kind of little flagellum like that and put some nutrients in the vicinity of this cell. So there's um, the cellular membrane has these receiving channels that pick up chemical signals, as we would say in semiotics. They detect and interpret the presence of the nutrients, and so the cell goes and moves towards that. This is semiosis. This is the interpretation of meaning. And so you could say that at our deepest, most cellular level, our life is rich with meaning. Tell that to the nihilists. So. <laughs> so for today's workshop, I wanted to really hone in on this concept of self, but go deeper than just the concept. And what does the self mean to us? There's probably a lot of things that inspired me to do it for today, this, this topic. But where I think the germ was really planted was um, when I heard in listening to a YouTube philosopher, Alan Watts actually, um, he mentioned a guru by the name of Sri Ramana Maharshi. And Ramana Maharshi had a method of self-realization or enlightenment. Um, I, I think there are many different methods, you know, and I've actually found um, that many areas of philosophy, including semiotics, can work as a method for that. Though when we do philosophy, we're doing it to gain um, that wisdom. I don't even know about if gain is the right word, but to to become wiser, to find, um, to understand, really, um, the world and how we have our place in it. Um, and so there's a commonality between philosophy and spirituality, right? Because they both ask questions that we don't normally ask, that penetrate to the, to the most core aspects of our being. Um, but the a key difference, I would say, I don't want to make a definitive distinction here, but a key difference is that in spirituality we're primarily looking at um, how do we apply that life? How do I become realized as an enlightened being? How do I get closer to God? How do I find peace? 
Um, whereas philosophy is more about understanding those things, and it can lead to these other spiritual experiences. Um, so Sri Ramana Maharshi isn't exactly a philosopher, but he is a spiritual guru, and his method of self-realization is a type of meditation called self-inquiry. And when people come to him, um, I believe he's passed now, but when people would come to him and say, Guru, Guru, I have all these problems. Um, I'm so unhappy with life. I don't know what to do. How do I get enlightened? He would say, who's asking? And uh, he implored people to do a type of meditation where you constantly ask yourself, who am I? Who am I? Who is it that's doing this? Who is it that's thinking? Who is it that's speaking right now? Um, the type of meditation I am most familiar with, being um, having spent longer studying the Zen tradition, is mindfulness meditation. In mindfulness meditation, we sit and first become aware of the breath, drop into a state of pure awareness, and as will always happen, thoughts will arise. And we recognize in the mindfulness meditation state those thoughts, and when we're getting lost and following the thoughts, say, okay, thanks, and come back to the pure awareness. Just let them come, let them go, and um, <coughs> the idea is not to identify so heavily with them. This self-inquiry meditation is a little different. Um, because it's more of a focus on that question of who am I. So I tried that for a little bit. Probably for almost an hour I was doing this. And first it's just sitting, meditating, who am I, who am I. And then the mind starts to drift. Um, and I remember this thing that I'm upset about that someone said to me. Who is it that's upset by this? I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, I'm really excited to teach this workshop this weekend. Who is it that's excited to do this? And it continues for a while. And for my experience, this realization started to come that I would go into all these different memories from my childhood of times when I really thought I was at my highest, times when I felt like I was being really shitty. Um, experiences of profound joy and profound <coughs> suffering. Every time I say, who is it that has that memory? Who is it that ha has these experiences? And, and it comes even deeper to, who is it that's remembering all of this right now? And in these memories, so you might sort of come up with answers. Philosophers will often try to come up with answers to these questions. So am I the body that was there in that memory and there in that? Maybe he was a little boy then, a little taller now. But if I'm the body, then the body's changing. So am I always changing? Like the, the river that the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus described. Heraclitus famously said, you can't put your hand in the same river twice. It's always flowing, it's always changing. But then think about those times where you've had a dream that was just so, so vivid. In a world that has no connection of, of a strict timeline to this world where we find ourselves right now. Maybe certain characters come up that are familiar to ones that we met here. Maybe certain places that have a familiar scent. Do I have a body in these dreams? Who is it that is experiencing these dreams? So at that point, there comes to a sense of a, a pure conscious awareness that can be described in so many different ways, but if you keep coming back to it, it's always there. As long as there is an awareness, whether it is the I who was dancing last night or the I who's teaching this workshop right now. I is really just the word that we use to refer to this happening, to this seeing out that's going on. But is it a seeing out or is the activity coming in? So here's where I'd like to um, sort of 
bring one of my favorite aspects that semiotics brings to this. So, um, let's have one of us here enjoying a wonderful object. Or is it an object? We'll talk about that in a bit. And we might say from one angle, this is perhaps the most common way of looking at it, for those who haven't reflected on this. I am seeing the tree. I'm seeing everything that's going on around. Oh, look at that thing. It is. Is it? I wonder what I wonder what this experience means to that little creature. <laughs> so this is a common way of conceptualizing and framing the way we relate to the world. I have a centralized awareness that is seeing, hearing, everything else. Um, another way of looking at it is something articulated by um, empiricism, uh, empiricist philosophers, which are empiricism is like we derive our knowledge from physical objects and, and facts and experiences in the world that we perceive with our senses. That's the main angle of empiricist philosophers. And they like to say that the world is imprinting on us. Some would say that there's a vari variety of sense data that we organize through the conceptual structures of our brain um, to create the meaning, to be able to meaningfully relate to that. Um, John Locke would say that the mind is a blank slate and our experiences form impressions on that. So when we're born, our mind is a blank slate, but as we go through our lives, it gets all these different indents and, and grooves in it from our variety of experiences, and that's how you end up with different people and different personalities. All right, it's pretty plausible. I actually used to uh, swing that way and say, yeah, empiricism makes the most sense. Yeah, and it certainly makes sense. But um, now it's not the way that I most like to conceptualize things because I found the semiotic way. In the semiotic way, we acknowledge both aspects of this. Yeah. The being teamwork interrelating with the world. Um, because as we come into experience with a specific conceptual framework, that affects the way that we bring things in and understand them. Um, what our intentions are, what our prior information is, is going to change what we focus on, what we notice, and what it means to us. And similarly, any change in the environment is going to affect the way that we encounter things. Um, and another way of looking at that in semiotically is we have this interrelating process um, that also um, we look at particularly the meaning between us. So a good example of this is one that I thought of that I really liked was I was playing a song when I was hiking with a friend on my ocarina flute in the woods and it was for a ritual to charge this crystal and I thought, you know, I could play something more beautiful. It wasn't really that beautiful. But it was very powerful, that series of notes that I played. And I was talking to him about how when I made that song, I wasn't trying to make something beautiful. I was trying to make something powerful. And when I heard it, it had that power to me, but I didn't hear it as something that's beautiful. And uh, I love that example of a song or a dance or a form of art where what intention you put into this creative expression and that affects the form that it takes and yet you don't ever know what the viewer which could also be yourself you know when you're dancing you're also dancing for yourself just as much as those around you when you sing a song when you perform music you you have to hear it to know what you're playing um, but that interpretive process is something that changes on both ends the interpreter and the signal so our concepts that are more abstract especially, all happen within this interspersed field of meaning. So let's take that idea of beauty, for example. Um, the common way of looking at in our culture 
it's more kind of like from an empiricist trait that some people, some things, some songs, whatever, are beautiful. They have this quality of being beautiful, and we perceive that. Um, whereas, um, what makes a lot more sense to me is really like that saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's a process of interpretation, because what some, that song I played, someone might have heard that and thought, oh yes, that's quite beautiful. And I'd say, well, I wasn't trying to make something beautiful, but, well, they interpreted as they did anyways. There's a great parable from the Zhuangzi. Um, Mao Liang and Lady Li were the most beautiful ladies in all the land, and um, men would run to give them gifts and shower them and ask for their affections. But when they walk down the path by the stream, fish swim to the bottom of the stream, deer run away from them, and birds fly away in fear. So of these four, men, birds, fish, and deer, who holds the standard of beauty? And does beauty have to be safe? Because things were running away because there's maybe fear. Well, it's a trick of the words. You say, oh, these people are so beautiful. But you might say the deer don't think so. The deer think they're quite scary. But the deer might also think that they're beautiful and scary. Perhaps. If only the deer could speak our language, <laughs> we might have a better idea of that. Okay, when you say trying to be beautiful, are you saying that you are putting that, the intention on that object? So suppose you have... Or, or your song. Yeah, so you have a concept of beauty, and beauty is an example that I thought of then. You could use any kind of abstract concept, you know, um, justice, charisma, but there's so many. But like, let's take with beauty. The artist creating the art has an idea of what's beautiful, and they attempt to express it. And that's sort of a semiotic thing there. You think, how am I going to do something that's understood as being beautiful? I want to paint a beautiful landscape, or this landscape is beautiful. I want to paint it, or I want to internalize the beauty of this landscape and paint an abstract fantasy one, or I've had this experience. There's a lot of um, visionary art I've noticed popping up, at least around in Colorado lately, where people have uh, deep psychedelic experiences, or maybe a deep dream experience, and they want to convey that through art. And art's really a wonderful way of uh, putting out this meaning in the world. Because with language, we have these set reference and representation, and it's like a custom. You say a sentence, and those of us who know the language understand what you're saying, unless they're missing the definition of a few words, which is why I had to define some terms at the beginning of this. But with art, it's weird, because art's not quite like a language. Every painting that someone makes, it, it works with the the mutually received medium of color and line and shape, but that color and line and shape can be formed and sculpted into any form imaginable and achievable by by hands, you know. Whatever you can paint is possible to paint. Whatever movement you can dance is possible to dance. But what's that going to mean is a little bit unpredictable. But even with language, there's that aspect there's that aspect of a word having different connotations for some people. A certain word might actually be triggering for someone or very offensive, whereas for someone else it could bring them into a state of exaltation, joy, and even enlightenment. Um, so let's look more at the side of objects, and I want to um, familiarize you with a way of viewing things that doesn't require us to say that we're encountering objects per se, um, and that's phenomenology. So that's going to be probably the last new word for many of you today. Um, but I found that this is really powerful. All right, so phenomenology is a more recent development in philosophy, like in the last century. Um, I'll spell it for you. So take anything, this pen for example, or actually let's say this tree. You're all sitting on this side of the tree right now. 
what you see is the shape of this bark, these specific branches and the leaves coming out. And um, there's this whole other side to the tree that you're not looking at right now. Um, but some of you may have seen before. Maybe some of you haven't actually looked at the tree that long. So if we don't look at it in terms of, in, of the phenomena, we'd say, there's a tree here. The phenomenological way of looking at it is we have this view of the tree. This is a phenomenon right here. And through walking around it and seeing every side of it and seeing new aspects of it, moment to moment, each moment, when we come back to this side and remember the other sides that we saw, and together we form that abstract idea of tree. But what we're really experiencing is something that bears forth uh, to us. It exists. Before we objectify it and give it a name of tree, it comes out in experience, and this can be the way that we view the world phenomenologically is um, to be mindful of that. Like, wow, I have created this concept of all of these things and objects around me, of all of these people, of all of these selves that have come forth to me in various different phenomena, and yet I've abstracted this idea of self. So then, all of these memories are actually of a, a multifaceted set of phenomena that at the time when I referred to myself encountering these phenomena, there you go, it's the self again. That's the language, that's the concept of finding that placeholder for where everything's happening. Because where it's always happening is here, whether in the dream world, this world, there's not so much of a difference between them if you take away that conceptual distinction of dream and reality. I mean, really, the only difference is that uh, the dream's a lot shorter. You know, this has been going on for a while, but um, what makes it more real than the dream when you view things in terms of phenomena um, sort of breaks down. And that's why we don't just stick with only the phenomena, but the phenomenological view looks at that and looks at how we construct our reality from the phenomena. And so if we apply semiotics onto the phenomenological approach, we recognize that we derive these meanings from all of our various experiences. The one who is encountering each of these phenomena, the self occurs as a phenomenon. The self is happening get my person and tree back up again. We're used to seeing the self over here, but in this process of interrelating, the self happens here. We interpret things as being a self interpreting things. But the interpretation, the semiosis, happened back when cells first started dividing, before there was an idea of self at all. And through this emergent complexification of semiotic processes, going from the cell level up through plants, up to animals, more and more complex umwelt, until you come to the development of language, the ability to recognize the semiotic process happening, or the, the process of semiosis happening, that's when we do semiotics. Um, one of my favorite uh, biosemiotics theories says, think of us not as homo sapiens, but as homo semioticus. Because indeed, and like a philosophy professor of mine once said, it's not that people speak, it's that speaking peoples. For indeed, it is only at that point of reflection and this conceptual framing and interpretation at the level of semiosis, we look at this semiosis and we come to this topic of the self. And yet, who is it that's aware of that?
when you get to that deep of a level of questioning who am I, it seems like any answer you can give just gets absorbed back into that process. It seems that the self is just as much received in interpretation with the world Just as much of our encountering the phenomena of the self is balanced with our creation of that. Our way of defining ourselves, of picking and choosing our concepts. So, like, suppose you have some sort of, of jewelry or hello, object hello. or special thing that you keep with you uh, because it reminds you of a certain aspect of yourself or you choose to dress in a certain way or present as a certain gender, you reflect on a history, a family, a culture, a tradition, so many things that we situate ourselves in and so many things that we leave aside and say, I'm not that, I'll nor am I that. I am, I am this, but I am not that. So there's this creative aspect, and yet there's also the encountering of the self, the looking in the mirror, the looking at the world, because all of this is all still happening here. How could I know myself without the other to whom I relate? And in fact, self implies other. That's the thing about language, is that it drives a wedge through our experience. And when you say, I am here now, this is my apple, this is my workshop that I'm teaching. It's not yours. Um, that's the trick that happens when we hold on to that language and we assume that as the reality and we don't take that semiotic stance and reflect and say, well, how did we get to this point at all? And when we don't ever reflect, you can see many of the conflicts and, and great um, suffering that happens in this world happens with people who are stuck in one mode of relating to everyone else as a self who is separate. So much of our ecological environmental devastation happens with that relating to the world as a self who must consume and take. But what happens when we start to encounter one another without assigning these labels and concepts? When we have that pure phenomenological consciousness experience, now this isn't something that we can or practically should stay in all the time um, because, you know, if I'm chopping vegetables and I'm completely wrapped in the existential unity of everything, I might not pay attention to my finger that's separate from the carrot there. But what we do in semiotics is we're becoming aware of that process of distinguishing. And by becoming aware of that, we become aware of the implications. And so what happens when we view ourselves as one and related with the world, as rather than alien visitors or souls who just found our ways into these bodies, as uh, beings that have grown from this, and, and the soul is that unity of life that connects us all. That's another way of thinking of self. When we start to consider what it really means. Thank you. If anyone would like to, let's see, what time is it? My phone... 11.30. Great. We've got 15 minutes to, uh, if anyone's got something on their mind, something you want to comment or say, we can have a, open it up to conversation now. I absolutely adore Sterner. I am the unique. Yeah, cool. <laughs> uh, I, was, yeah, I was wondering if you were going to maybe like sign it. Well, Sterner is wonderful. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware, the philosopher Max Sterner um, wrote a, his most famous work 
is commonly translated as the ego and its own, uh, though I prefer the translation the unique and its property. And his main thesis in that is the I, the individual, has various concepts in its head. And we have many ways of being in society that say, you must be this, you can aspire to this. And these concepts, right, that we elevate and make into idols, we idealize them and therefore subjugate ourselves to these concepts. And what Stirner says is that what you really are at your core is the unique. You know, all of these leaves of this tree look um, very, this is not an example Stirner uses, but I'm using the example. Um, they look similar from <coughs> afar, but each leaf is completely unique in its location in space, in the way that the wind's moving it, in the particular striations of its veins. So, um, it, even if you... So that very idea of being unique or same or being a human or being whatever is, is an idea in your head and that's what Stirner is trying to knock down and say, uh, he, he says a lot of other stuff too, but I think that's sort of where you thought of Stirner there. Yeah. I'd love to get like, you explaining that even into the dance world. Martha Graham says it's not your job to judge it, it's your job to keep the channel open. Yeah. <laughs> yes, if you're more. not there, it's yeah, just keeping that channel open. Yes. Well, there's a curious thing that happens, you know. Um, I first noticed this quite a few years ago. Um, when I was at a concert, I was really loving the music, and I felt this amazing state of bliss. And then I started thinking about something outside the show, or someone did something, and I started focusing on that. And suddenly, I felt kind of tied up. I was like, what's, why am I not feeling so good? And then I looked back at the music and was like, wow. And I realized there's this thing I'm supposed to be paying attention to, it feels like, that I'm not. Um, but whether you're supposed to be paying attention to it or not, what I realized was when I'm in awareness, and that's the thing about enjoying art, music, all kinds of forms of art, is it really, it's something there that invites you to become conscious, to become present in the moment. And music is a really great instance of this because it's continuously going over a longer span of time to where if you break your focus, you'll notice the music's been playing and you weren't even listening to it because you were too busy getting caught in the thoughts or, or thinking about how much you're enjoying it. You know, sometimes people come up to me, and I'm not going to be like, don't ever do this, but some people come up and be like, man, this is really good. I'm like, yeah. And then you start judging it. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, it is good. I mean, I feel like I've seen them before, and they were better last time, but I don't know. I guess maybe if they did this and as soon as you get out of that, I mean, it's, it's our nature to want to give expression, to say something meaningful and connect with each other through language. Um, man, like... This show sucks, or, oh man, yeah, this is really good. And we express that, but then if you catch on to that and then just get stuck in your language, who knows how long it's going to be until you become aware again. Yeah, that's why public artworks. Brain goes better place. What about public artworks? Um, just pu art in public places. It takes your brain and it invites it to be in that creative space for a moment. Yes. Um, oh, why it's so, so good. I love those experiences, especially when you're like cutting through an alley and you're like, oh, I'm just getting getting where I'm going and then hidden in the corner is this immaculate mural. It's like, wow, I would never have seen that if I hadn't taken this way. It's a physical response. You had touched on um, when we change our, like say you give a word different meaning and then the effects upon infiltration through, um, I guess I'd like to, you to expand on that. Or it's like, okay, for example, say well, the one that came to mind was, oh, passing through our starting to, and, 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 okay, so the word quit, nowadays it's like quitting smoking, quitting that, um, yeah. But, you know, it's not such a good word, you know. I mean, it doesn't feel good to hear it. But in the, like, its original meaning, it meant the quiet. 
it was the end of the day where you could quiet yourself. Um, I love that. I love that you bring the etymology into this. That's actually a word that I'm kind of trying to redefine my responses to in myself so that it just comes to mind. But Yeah, um, so... Um, a basic semiotic aspect of this comes from the uh, philosopher Ferdinand de Saussure. And if you read his uh, course on linguistics, you can get much deeper into this. Um, and I recommend it. If you just look up Saussure, you'll find it. So he is considered one of the grandfathers of semiotics because he took linguistics and really wanted to zoom into why are words meaningful as they are to begin with. Um, this was before semiotics really became a word, and he called what he was doing semiology, um, which is focusing on the sign activity, but really just within language. And one of the aspects he talks about is the relations between um, words as they're conceptually aligned in our brains. So like the word quit, you could have um, different activities that you quit doing. You could have um, other words that you related to. So like exit, stop, um, I don't know, done. Loser. Uh, yeah, loser. To lose in a game, you quit. Or, you know, kind of a, yeah, right. You know, I, I quit. Thing. I give up. Yeah. You know. Quitters never win. And you can do this with uh, any word, by the way. And then you also have your um, relations to past experiences you've had. I don't think Saussure goes into that as much. Um, he's more focused on the language itself. But each word is related to a bunch of other words and in the broader semiotic aspect to a bunch of memories, other meanings and concepts. And um, what I really love to do, I do this in every one of my blog posts. Uh, if you'd like to look up my philosophy blog, it's called Philosophizing with a Hammer. But I look at the etymology of words because I think that when you look at where did this word come from, it further deepens that meaning for you. And a lot of th ways that we use words has changed over time. Um, like, pretty much none of the words that we use today are, mean exactly what they did uh, in their previous languages. And, you know, English, modern English is a pretty recent language. Um, uh, it really started to develop after 1066, the invasion of the Norman Conquest. But if you look at etymology of words, you'll actually go back and see where it came from Old Germanic, Old Church Slavonic, Old English, Proto-Germanic, going all the way back to pretty much all of our languages, at least in the West, at least all of our English words that I know of come from Proto-Indo-European. Um, and then you can see how this concept has evolved and developed over time. A lot of our language um, was really rooted in physical experience before, like for example, fear used to denote uh, an actual danger or a risk. And now it's a word that refers to the emotion we feel when we're experiencing this. So it's become metaphorical to describe an emotion, a sense, a sense within. Um, so a lot of our language has done that. Um, so that's sort of to fill in what you're asking about. The way that all of our concepts are related, any way that we could come and reflect and deepen and enrich that, that's a big part of my project of Meaning is Alive is sort of waking up to that and the fun with what I do in the blog especially is taking a deep dive into a concept that we may have taken for granted and revealing these aspects that we never considered before. Um, well that I certainly hadn't considered until I looked into it. I can't speak for my readers but again that's why I don't see myself as a teacher. I, I view it like a facilitator for a mutual experience of inspiration. Um, by doing the work of the intention of digging into this and publishing it and teaching and talking about like that, I create uh, more opportunity and spaces for us to do that. But like, remember, that's something we can all do. We're already all doing it together all the time. Does that sort of give you what you were looking for there?
Yeah, I was just um, asking where you would go with that concept of um, redefining words within ourselves. Yeah. Um, from the day to day. Yeah, it's um, on the day to day. I mean, there's a lot of things for us to focus on that take our attention. So we're in that space right now, this philosophizing space. Um, and when you can take a moment to sit and think about that, I mean, even when you, <coughs> when you read about something new or you learn something new that somebody told you, um, that could change the meaning of a word for you. Um, when we do it ourselves and sort of meditate and reflect or maybe write in our journal, I think it can happen then. Um, but really, the semiotic disposition is sort of an openness to allow that to happen. When you step into life and just have that foundation of meaning is alive, that in itself, I think, is far more open to this fluidity and flow. Because again, like Heraclitus said, you can't ever step in the same river twice. Um, our concepts are always subtly and slightly shifting in this interrelated framework. And one shifting could break it, the whole thing down and then it reassembles. So yeah, um, a, a great way of doing this, I think, is actually the use of oracles. Um, and I didn't actually get to that. So uh, one of my favorite oracles is the I Ching. The I Ching is um, ancient Chinese oracle. So an oracle is like the Tarot. Or um, you can get various oracle card decks. The Tarot is probably the most commonly known one. The I Ching is a set of hexagrams. There's 64 that you can get. And you flip coins to get it. And um, it's each one has a meaning and it's also associated with different elements. You, you have a set of eight trigrams and the combinations of two trigrams makes a hexagram, so eight times eight is 64. And one of the trigrams is wind. And when I was doing the self-inquiry meditation, I paused and I thought, I'm gonna ask the I Ching who I am. So I asked the I Ching, because you always ask it a question when you do it. I said, who am I? And the I Ching gave me um, wind over wind which has its own meaning in um, various different senses, but for me, I interpret it right then as wind coming in, wind going out. I felt like it was reminding me of the breath, that breathing that's happening. As long as the breathing's happening, there I am. Um, but I could have interpreted it a different way. Uh, but curious how you bring this uh, new stimulation, this new sign into your experience when you play with the oracle. You ask a question, right? And suddenly you get this insight that changes how you were thinking about the question itself. How you were thinking about all the factors that play into it. And maybe even changes the way that you viewed yourself as coming into that situation or the meaning of the different aspects of that situation. In fact, I could imagine asking the oracle um, about what does this word or this concept really mean to me, especially if it's something that you've been struggling with, something that, because, you know, what I talk about, it's a great process to do, but it's not something that always happens automatically. We have sometimes hang-ups and traumas that keep us locked in to one way of being in the world. And that's also part of why I really love and recommend therapy not just for people who are like in a really bad spot and struggling, but for people who just want to have a space for reflection with the assistance of the dialogue of another person, is that my favorite moment with my therapist is when we um, come to view the situation I'm talking about. I see it suddenly that I was only looking at it one way, and now I can relate to it differently. I can feel differently about it because I see it. I understand it differently. And we can have that dialogue within ourselves. We can have that dialogue with a friend. It doesn't have to be with the therapist. They're a great person to do that because they're literally dedicated to talking about you and what's going on in your mind. That's why I bring up that example. Um, but perhaps that's the best space where that happens. 
is in that space of dialogue within yourself, but especially uh, with the others we encounter. Because we have our different uh, frameworks, our different umwelt coming together, and yet in the same world, right? But we inform each other through our differences of experience and understanding. And even so much as talking to someone about something and you suddenly realize, wait, what do you mean by that? Oh, I never thought of it that way. You could have a totally different definition or connotation, more likely, of a word and not realize it until you started talking to each other. And when you're in a conversation and you have a disagreement, what happens when you flip to, I have to be right, I have to make them understand this point I'm trying to make, to, we're here to express ourselves, convey the truth that we're coming into it. Is there some truth or commonality between us? Um, perhaps, but if we recognize, oh wait, we didn't even understand this word the same way. Okay, I don't necessarily agree with that, or maybe someone does change their understanding right then. But even saying that I now know someone else can understand this situation in this way that's different from mine. You don't have to switch to, to believe or understand it even in the way that they do. But now having that knowledge of that other way of being has already changed that word or that concept for you. So those are some of the ways, I'd say. What time are we at now? Great. That's when this was uh, supposed to end. Unless anyone has anything burning in them to ask about, we can go a little longer, but I'm also happy to close the circle now. I got a question. Yes, please. Um, on the subject of meanings of words, um, knowing this, how do we define what's good and bad and what our actionable goal should be moving forward knowing the semiotic relationship between us and this other is things. a wonderful question good and bad. so <laughs> there's actually a whole aspect of semiotics that looks at this and we call it semioethics so in ethics and philosophy uh, we ask ourselves what is good what is the good or right thing to do and of course involved in that is what is bad in semioethics, we take a step deeper and we say, what does it mean to be good? What does this good mean? And um, I like to encourage people to think about that and ask that. Now, to do this sort of involves taking a stance towards our morals and our ways of conduct that says they're open to interpretation. And some people are a bit afraid of doing that. Some people say, um, it's better to have an objective morality that is static and stationary because then we have that like as a compass so that we don't do wrong. However, if we say we're viewing the world objectively and suppose we come upon some new information that we didn't understand before, like when you're doing science, science claims to be objective. Um, science claims to be looking for facts. So if you really think there are moral facts, you would also have to say that they're open to being, um, we're, we're open to saying I understand it better or I've changed what I know to be a fact upon receiving this new information, right? Um, and then you can also be more open and say, well, I don't need an objective morality. I just need something that allows me to relate in a healthy way to others. So. Um, I think each person gives kind of a different answer. And when you recognize that your morality, your good and bad, is something that you've uh, interpreted through your experiences in the world, whether you believe that you've learned moral facts and it's objective, or you think of it more in like a non-cognitivist kind of, um, it, it's more something you feel kind of way, um, I'm, there's, there's a whole field of ethics that I could get into. Um, but the, the thing is, I think that the semiotic angle to this is recognizing not only that we can evolve what we consider to be good and bad and do it with a sensitivity to the context we find ourselves in of relating to other people, um, but also understanding that people who don't view things the same way as me may not have the same morals as me. And because of that, not everyone's going to be able to get along. 
Um, but if we are staunch and stuck in our ways of being, then we may never even understand that. And then, again, we have more justification to increase each other's suffering. Um, now, I tend to view it very wide open, um, like any other um, sign or semiotic interpretation process. I view our morals, our, our good and bad, our ethics, as happening within that, um, I erased it, but that inner process, uh, it's not so much inner, it's the interrelating process that cuts between subjective and objective, and the morals or meanings that happen within that. But it also happens within a context. So we're, um, you know, humans, we're large apes uh, with the need to eat, the need to stay at a certain temperature, to, to rest. We have a good familiarity of each other's emotions. Um, and so there's these things that we can recognize ourselves as having in common or recognize about being a, a, a body that has to be taken care of at this time that we can use as a starting point. So to have a common um, ethical ground, a good starting point is to look at what we have in common. Um, and then the semiotics can happen from there. Um, this is an area that I could probably do a whole workshop on, but those are some of my thoughts on your questions.